Thank you, Donna. Um, it's, it's, I think this is my third time speaking at the conference, and I, I always feel the need to apologize that I'm from California. Uh, but in addition to California, I now live in Nevada, where I escaped California, but I have a heart for California, and I have a heart for sex ed. So I'm, I'm now um, battling sex ed in two different states. And as they say in Las Vegas, and Donna kind of alluded to it, what happens in California doesn't stay in California. And I can assure you, and I think after my presentation, you will see that this has spread um, far and wide, and it's not just a California issue. And so I'm hoping that we can, I can motivate you to go back um, and get, institute some change. Um, so our talk today, or my presentation is on comprehensive sex education and what the goal is. And I think you've kind of heard already a little bit of, of what the goal is, but I'm gonna give you some tangible, specific things directly out of the mouths of the people promoting comprehensive sex education. Ooh, that was supposed to be white, uh, my, my lettering, sorry. So CSE, um, what is it? I would argue these days all sex education is comprehensive sex education. Um, it has moved way beyond what we were taught in school. It's way beyond puberty and, you know, you need to use deodorant, you're going to get pimples. More often than not, they're not even covering that in puberty education for fifth graders. And I apologize, that's supposed to be white writing. I think the transfer, okay. So comprehensive sex ed has become, and Monica talked about this, more about sexuality, your sexual rights, and the new trend is very much in sexual pleasure. And I'm just gonna read some stuff from um, Planned Parenthood and Secus. They believe that sexual pleasure is a right, that sexual pleasure should be enjoyed by all people of all ages. I, I remember sitting at a school board meeting in Reno, Nevada, talking about elementary school curriculum. Now, let me tell you, Nevada, 16 of the 17 counties are conservative. Reno is one that goes back and forth, but Las Vegas is, is where we, we want them to go off with California those of us that live in Nevada. We want Clark County to leave and go off um, and join California and leave the rest of us alone. So I'm in, I'm in Reno, school board meeting, talking about sixth grade curriculum, and one of the committee members that's a medical advisor was very disturbed that we were not talking about the pleasure girls get in fifth and sixth grade with the clitoris or clitoris, because there was a lot of debate over how to say that at that same meeting. That's what they were focusing on, the pleasure. And why aren't we telling girls the pleasure they can have in fifth and sixth grade? They want to make sure that kids aren't limited, and they want to make sure that they can exercise their right without interference. Well, who's the interference? The parents, and I would argue the church. Um, talking from International Planned Parenthood, they actually say that sex should be enjoyable, safe for sex and pleasure, masturbation, and that they need to address stigma associated with pleasure. It's not sex education. It's how to have sex, how to have it, and be pleasurable. And it's not just happening in California. So many of you who've been around a long time and Eagle Forum has know about CECUS. And they finally came out and said what many of us always knew, but this is the key that you need to understand as we go forward. They announced major branding change a couple of months ago. Now it's something we all were trying to tell people they were doing the last 55 years, and people thought, oh, you're just saying the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Well, it fell. Secus, here's, here's what they announced proudly in their press release. Today, CECUS, Sex Education for Social Change, formerly known as the Sexuality Information and Education Council of the United States, launched a rebrand. The effort follows a multitude of organization initiatives, and sex education is a vehicle for change. That's why I have it up there. Sex education is for social change. That is their goal, 
That is their intent. They also say, seek us. We believe sex ed can spark the social change we need in response to a variety of pressing issues from sexual violence, reproductive injustice, and LGBTQ discrimination. They're telling us what their goal is. We need to listen to them. They're telling us the whole point of sex education is social change. That's why they just finally came out after 55 years and admitted it. Seek as sex ed for social change. So what does that mean? Um, so I'm gonna tell you because they're telling us. Sika says that with sex education, we have a golden opportunity to create a cultural shift. Okay, they're telling us in their own writing, they want to create a cultural shift. We need to believe them that that's what they're doing and that that is the intent and purpose behind sex education. And then it goes on about reproductive injustice, LGBT, Q, equality, sexual violence, gender equity. And they're changing the language on a lot of this stuff, and I loved hearing Barb, which by the way, not only is she great and is it true about Minnesota, Minnesota so nice, people say, but it really is. She is an, also an awesome hostess and cook, and her chicken cordon bleu is amazing. So I just had to throw that out there when I knew you were coming. I was like, I need to get that recipe. So in addition to all of her activism, she, she cooks for activists, so anyway. I loved listening to Barb and, and using the correct language. We need to call him a him when it's a him. We need to say a boy who thinks he's a girl, not a transgender man or a transgender girl. We need to make sure that we are not letting them get away with the shift in language because that's how they achieve social change. You need to, you can do it respectfully. Uh, I, it, it's interesting, I am friends with a the very first San Francisco transgender cop and presents as a woman, regrets the sex change, and I have a hard time going back he, she, so I just say the person's name. But it's important that we say a man who thinks he's a girl. You cannot change your gender. They're a boy or they're a girl. So I wanna give a quote from, and again, uh, this is one of the curriculums in California that's being used for elementary school, and here's a quote from the teacher. Puberty, the wonder years, doesn't just stick to puberty. The curriculum also includes lessons on topics that I think are necessary, such as bullying, social, emotional components. There's a lot of scripting for really good conversation and prompts for the teachers. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and, and how you can find out what's going on in your classroom because you may look at the curriculum all you want, but the teacher's edition has all the scripting and the questions to get the organic conversations going. So when the parents complain, they can go, oh, well, Susie asked a question and I was just answering it. So how does social justice and sex education kind of go together? And I, I'm gonna give you just one of the stories they give. And it's the story of Bo or I should say the story of Bobby. And this is directly from the puberty education. So they tell a story of Bo, and Bo was kicked out of their family home when he was outed as gender nonconforming. Because you know the Christians kick their kids out the minute they do something that we don't agree with. The school called Bo's parents when Bo asked the teachers to call him Bo instead of Bobby and use pro pronouns they, them, theirs. The parents said it was a sinful choice. Again, parents are the problem. A few weeks later, he's out on the street, then he's out of money, then he's doing survival sex, then he's in a shelter, then he's getting beat up, then he's being sexually harassed at school. And the reason this is happening is because they aren't teaching sex education in schools. Here's what their answer is as they tell this story to elementary school age kids. If the students at Bo's school had access to comprehensive sex ed, including topics of gender identity and sexual orientation, they'd be less judgmental. If Bo's family members, again, we're the obstacle, we're the problem. If we had access to information, we're stupid, about the variety and uniqueness of sexuality that occurs, they, the family, would be more prepared and less frightened and more supportive of Bo. 
And then this goes to an important point. If community leaders, police, and lawmakers were educated about sexuality, they would work together in solidarity to create and enforce law, practices, policies that would embrace that. So the re-education of everyone, our parents, our church, our law enforcement. So CECAS ended their, their big reveal and announcement saying, hey, from now on, you will rarely see our name without our tagline, which is sex ed for social change. It's a promise. We are working toward a world where all people can experience and enjoy sexual reproductive freedom as they define it for themselves. By advancing sex ed for social change, we know that we can make the world a reality. You will not hear it because it's, you will hear it whenever you hear their name because it's a promise. That's a, that's a commitment. That's a commitment to social change. So I, I found the quote from Maya Angelou, and this is so true. When someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Don't think that Planned Parenthood or CECAS or the health teacher in your community isn't doing this because she goes to your church. If they're affiliated with these organizations, they're doing it, they're proud of it, and they've made it clear that they will continue to do it. And their goal is social change. It is not our kids' health. There is no condom for the heart. And they are making it clear. They are after our kids, and they're willing to go that, that direction and right into the school. So the, the plan, and it's interesting because um, Tim Gaglin said, the left, they move fast. They move incredibly fast. And so I'm hoping that if you're on the front end of it, you can get it stopped. But I have a feeling, working in numerous states on sex education, that the, the stories I'm going to share are going on everywhere. Um, and I want to encourage you to get to the truth because they are fast and they're very organized too. The left is very organized. Um, and they coalition together. We need to coalition together a little bit more and split up some of the work. Um, I look around this room and some of us, Dawn has been here, well, a thousand years, I heard earlier. But in the fight, we need to bring more people with us and we need to equip our youth um, and, and we need, again, people have talked about it. I'm not saying anything new about, you know, our pastors. So I ran into, um, as I do, Donna warned me about language, so I'm not going to say the bad words Monica said, um, which I usually say all the time, and they roll off my tongue. I never, I'm just going to say, I don't think I said anal sex until like three years ago. And I grew up in Boulder, Colorado. So I, I, it's like, you just didn't, now it's like, I don't go a day without saying it two or three times. But I want to talk about something that everyone needs to read, and it's called The Blueprint for Sexual and Reproductive Health Rights and Justice. And this was done by a group of 80 organizations, and it's their blueprint. They are organized. This is why they can move so fast. They have their plan already out there. We're behind the eight ball. So in the executive summary, it talks about a coalition of 80 organizations that have signed on to this blueprint that you need to get. And OK, that's OK. I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell you what they are. They're, there are 80 organizations, but they're, they're the, all the players, advocates for youth. It's interesting. They have American atheists. What does that have to do with reproductive justice, or so-called reproductive justice? Catholics for choice. Guttmacher, gender justice, which I want to talk to Minnesota about gender justice too. They're in Nevada as well. Uh, NARAL, National Abortion Federation, People for the American Way, Planned Parenthood of America, SICA, Sierra Club, Center for Sexual Pleasure and Health. That's a fun website to go to. They have signed on to this blueprint. They have laid out the master plan of how to get to our kids. They say, as advocates for gender inequality in advancing reproductive health, rights, and justice, we know that our reproductive and sexual autonomy are the core of some of the most important decisions impacting our lives, our communities, and our families. The blueprint lays out how they are going to go into states and, the, and go in and change the laws on sex education. 
They're going to um, go in and work on the judiciary. They actually were so bold, and I, I sent this over to ADF because they say that they want to go after making sure there are no religious exemptions for anything regarding health, which we know that, but they write it, that that is their goal, to make sure that judges and people they elect are going to ensure that our religious freedom is taken away and that we have no rights of conscience. They're upfront about it. So I want to talk about the deception and what's going on. Recently, I did, I, I'm somewhat foolish, I did an open records request, FOIAs, on all 900 California school districts. Um, and I don't know what I was thinking. And on the 17 school districts in Nevada. And we're about to release the information, and you can sign up for our email list if you want to. But what I'm here to tell you is the only way you're going to find out the truth about what's going on in your schools is with a FOIA. I cannot stress that enough. And same with libraries. I run across parents every day who say, well, I went and I, I met and I looked at the curriculum, and you know, they will tell me this long story. They did what you know, they think they're supposed to do. And then all I have to do is look up the FOIA. And it's like, no, they have a contract with Planned Parenthood, and they have since 2016. Do you know that memo of understanding with the contract with Planned Parenthood says that they will share all test questionnaire information data with Planned Parenthood? Did they tell you that when you went there? Did they tell you that this is going to be the big one that we break in, in a week or so? So you're hearing it here. I have a copy with uh, on letterhead from the PTA contracting with Planned Parenthood to teach sex education to fifth graders and hide it in their budget under assemblies. And getting around FOIA requests, they think. So I had to redo my FOIA requests for additional information because they, the school just says, well, we're not teaching it. They're very, just like Satan, they're very crafty. So you need to do, go behind closed doors and find out what's going on in your school district. Releasing the information is the only way you're going to be able to really address the problem is to find out and expose it. I mean, my PowerPoint's not working, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with a quote that, well, before I do my quote. I would love to see and work with anyone that wants to join Capital Resource Institute in doing FOIAs on every single school district in this nation and exposing the corruption, the curriculum, the grooming, the ties, the money that Planned Parenthood, that the textbook makers are all making, this vicious cycle. Planned Parenthood may be closing clinics, but they're right in our schools, <laughs> sending them to another clinic. And we're paying them with taxpayer funds federally, and we're paying them with, with school money. So I want to challenge you. The other side has made it clear who they are and what their intentions are. Who is going to stand between their blueprint and our kids? And as you see, it's societal change they want. So as many of us pull our kids out in homeschool, that's great. I advocate for that. Their aim is societal change. Who's going to stand in the way of their blueprint? Will you? Will you join with us? Pray about whether or not this is your calling, because there's a lot you're going to hear this weekend. But I would love to hear from you. And then I'll leave you with my favorite quote. If you've heard me speak before, I always use it. And it's William Wilberforce. And it says, you can choose to look the other way, but never again can you say that you did not know. Thank you.